Now, before we start a conversation on what critical neuroscience actually is focused upon in terms of providing an answer to these existential questions, I would like to take you uh, for a little tour of the main content and the chapters contained in this book. So the first chapter is the exact science of the hard matter. And this is something that I really, really care about. Uh, I care about the scientific method um, in a day and age in which we are living, uh, an age in which science very often is attacked from a multiple uh, perspectives and uh, perspectives that are often politically motivated or they are a result of a poor understanding of what science is. Sometimes they are the result of fear, of um, misplaced pseudo-traditional values. I feel that we need science in this world and my contribution uh, in the field of neuroscience and psychology starts with chapter one. Now, the chapter examines general aspects of the scientific method, focused especially on neural underpinnings of behavior, and then what is actually mean, what, what is the purpose of examining, controlling, verifying, and whether our ability to understand the data, also from a statistical standpoint, can shed some light on the very nature of being. And so, in each chapter, I try to focus on basic subfields of uh, neuroscience and uh, try to present both a historical as well as a uh, logical philosophical understanding of each of the subfields. Then um, within chapter two we have between psyche and mind which um, is an attempt to bring forth a more holistic understanding of uh, neural processes and psychological processes. Uh, we are talking about recollection and therefore memory. Uh, there is uh, an analysis of hippocampal structure, limbic system, and the connection with uh, the prefrontal cortex, outer cortical uh, areas, and what it means actually to practice psychotherapy in the context of a better understanding of neuroscience. Um, a subchapter is talking to the mind and mind talking. Now, I, I like to mention um, here the fact that uh, being a psychologist, a psychotherapist, and then a scientist myself, I do value quote unquote talk therapy very much. Um, and, and the reason why I do that is predicted upon a series of variables that are um, monitor and control verified, empirically verified um, in multiple studies and meta analysis, but also there is a very profound uh, philosophical assumption at the base of any type of talk therapy. The assumption that change is possible. Now this seems to be somewhat of a given uh, in the sense that why would anybody go to a psychologist, a therapist, a psychiatrist if the person did not at least have a remote hope of getting better? Granted, there might be situations where due to referral or other um, legal clinical circumstances, the person might not be completely free to choose to uh, entertain psychotherapy as a um, clinical modality to, to feel better. But for the most part, the assumption is that things will change and they will change for that. So the assumption here is that we can operate a change using our words. Now, th this seems to be a very superficial statement, but it really relies upon a marvelous series of scientific discoveries, some of which might be related to mirror neurons, for instance, uh, some of which might be related to um, studies on corpus callosotomy. Uh, some are due to uh, unfortunate and yet fortunate uh, events such as the accident of uh, Phineas Gage. Um, the assumption again is that we talk and then there is a change on a neural level. Now I want to stress the importance of a healthy skepticism in this uh, area. I am not too fond of certain advertising strategy that would make empty promises, promises such as, well, if you just download this video game or this app, 
then you will be able to rewire your brain completely and within a week or so your IQ will skyrocket and you'll be the most intelligent person in the neighborhood. Now, I'm not even sure if I would wish upon us uh, this type of shortcut. Um, first of all, it's absolutely unscientific to make any of these claims. What is scientifically true is that for everything that we experience, everything we feel, everything we, we see, everything we hear, everything we understand in general, all our senses and beyond our senses, everything has a neural underpinning. And that's part of this between psyche and mind uh, discussion I would like to, to address. Um, so, per the term, there's something magical about psychotherapy. There's something that relies upon this transcendental link, really, between the spoken word, in the case of most psychotherapeutic modalities, and neural underpinnings. Now, again, no shortcut is a valid shortcut, and that's why I am very skeptical of this, you know, I want it all and we're here and now attitude that too often we have, especially in our Western understanding of psychological processes. Nevertheless, the assumption that we can make a change is a very solidly based one. Now, moving on to the next topic, medicine on, off, and off, with double F, the brain. Here I am attempting to uh, shed some light on the differences between disease, disorders, illness, and issues. Etymological uh, discussions aside, um, I feel the need of distinguishing between these terms because it really define how we approach clinical modalities and, and, and scope of treatment. So again, going from treating to healing to curing, uh, are these all the same or are we using these terms in a somewhat inappropriate way? Um, and this is because at least on paper, we would like to think of all of us as doctors, as researchers, as scientists, as having the best interest of the patient at the center of our therapeutic modalities. And very often we might miss the subjective beauty, if I you know, permit this, this term, of the, of the patient presentation and uh, deep philosophical complexity. Now, <clears throat> Focusing on the patient, of course, is only one very narrow element within the discussion. We also have to think about society and culture. Uh, I, I mentioned this multiple times in, uh, in, in many of my uh, psychotherapy sessions as well as in my lectures that um, mental health, particularly mental health disorders, are not only subject-based disorders, they are social disorders as well. Um, and I mention this many times because um, while it's very unscientific to tell a person that uh, it's just a question of being, for instance, anxious about something, depressed about something, as if once you remove this something, everything will be as good as new, so to speak, so that the person could literally you know, remove themselves from the problem as if the problem was never existing in reality, so to speak. But it's more the social connection between human beings that makes something real. Now, I don't want to take a existentialist stance in, in this context. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not suggesting we should take a uh, philosophical approach similar to, I don't know, Sartre can be the classic, um, but understanding that the environment, the context, the culture, and within culture we should really think about societal elements, religious, ethnic, spiritual elements, traditional elements do indeed play a role in the way we see ourselves. So this is already a transcendental element. Even if we want to think about um, a uh, ecological or deep ecological uh, perspective within developmental psychology, I'm thinking about Uri Brenner, for instance, or, or Larry Shelton. Even if we want to take that approach, we have to be holistically based. We cannot separate the individual from the context. Um, and, and, and this is, of course, not just you know, true for neuroscience and psychology and medicine. It's true for most of 
current scientific research. Again, I, I'm a little skeptic about certain fringe life statements, uh, for instance, related to uh, the utilization of uh, Schrodinger's uh, research to justify any type of quantum muffin. <laughs> Everything that is quantum based appears to be transcendently um, infused with a spiritual sense of self. Now, I, 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 I don't necessarily appreciate this pushing a scientific terminology simply to, to justify something that uh, it's not necessarily based on science. Uh, it's not necessarily anti-scientific. It's a scientific in a sense they might not even warrant the utilization of a scientific method for a type of claim made therein. I'm thinking about uh, theological claims that rely upon tradition, for instance. Um, we're talking about different magisteria here. Um, and so I really want to stress the importance of the situation where someone is sitting, literally sitting, situationally speaking, with their emotion, with their feeling, with their culture, which is something that you, you both uh, are cultivating, right? Uh, but it's also a cult. It's something that you pray to, pray within, you could say. And, um, and in this chapter, I also like to talk about mother nature and father nurture. It could also be the other way around, of course. Mother nurture, father nature. And I want to stress the importance of um, this synonymical, almost alchemical confusion between feminine and masculine. Now, metaphorically speaking, of course, where mother nature in this context represents all our genetic makeup. The you know usual sentence, my brain made me do it. So the more neurologically based or genetically based component of our uh, behavior and our emotional response mechanisms. And on the other side, father nurture. And by that we mean, of course, culture, tradition, history, and personal stories as well. Now, confusion in this context should be interpreted as the ability to merge, melt, combine together to opposites. Uh, to some extent, similarly to what Jungian um, perspective on the animus and the anima were, and again, something that goes far beyond the individual and the laboratory setting in which we perform a lot of our fMRI studies, for instance. Now, chapter six is the chapter on perception and cognition. Uh, we could even say that it's the chapter that discusses how do we know what we know, but even more important, how do we know that we know something. <laughs> so, um, from somewhat overused statements such as, you know, post Descartes, uh, cogito ergo sum, think, I think therefore I am, um, type of philosophical discussion, uh, all the way to the neural analysis of sensory motor mechanism, perception, memory production, retrieval, um, um, the connection between cortical areas and um, the so-called old man of the flesh, the, the limbic system, um, and the way we know what we see. So how we quantify and qualify evidence. Evidence, again, based on the scientific method, but also evidence as something that sheds light, that shines upon the truth, okay? Ex video in Latin, something that is really uh, coming at us in its it's in the fullness of the truth, we could say, philosophically speaking. So how do we know that we can see it with our naked eyes? And again, within this chapter, I refer to um, other uh, publication um, that focus on similar aspects, uh, including my, my, my previous book on, on medical philosophy um, and the analysis of the hierarchy of scientific evidence on one side, but also the transpersonal, for me the term, element, especially within the field of psychiatry. <clears throat> now, if there is a conclusion, which is chapter seven, 
The suggestion here is to utilize philosophy as a basic approach to neuroscience. And this is not necessarily new for the fields of science in general, especially from an epistemological standpoint. Uh, what I try to suggest here is that uh, neuroscience as a science, as a form of hard, natural, empirical, evidence-based science, does not contain or should not contain certain philosophical axioms, statements, and, and um, basic rules upon which the scientific method cannot be fully applied because we will have a conflict from a logical standpoint. So these rules, this principle, this assumption had to come from somewhere else. And my suggestion is, of course, that an appropriate philosophical methodology in this context could serve this purpose. Um, maybe the last thing I want to mention in this short video is that the last part of this chapter um, attempts to provide a model for this philosophic understanding. And it's a model that I call the triple S model. Uh, so self, soul, and spirit. I would like to um, present this model a little more in depth. We might be able to do that um, in another video, but for now I just want to present the basic um, knowledge in this uh, book simply from a didascalic standpoint with a, um, with a general um, understanding of the structure of the book. Uh, thank you very much for your patience and I will see you next time.